Good evening, everybody. My name is Carly with Charleston County Public Library, and you are here with us tonight for a conversation with Howard Reich. He was born in Chicago and at the age of 10, moved with his family to Skokie, a suburb of Chicago, which was also the nexus of Holocaust survivors like his parents. At the ripe age of 18, he was a piano performance major at Northwestern, and at 22, he began freelancing articles on music for the Chicago Daily News. The next year, he started contributing arts coverage to the Chicago Chicago Tribune, and he was hired full-time in 83. It's where he spent his entire newspaper career. His stories have taken him from London to Paris, Warsaw, Vienna, Moscow, Munich, Prague, Havana, Panama, and other areas, as well as maybe his favorite city, Chicago. Um, after 30 years of serving as the Tribune's jazz critic, he was also appointed the newspaper's classical and opera critic. He retired from the newspaper this year, and he lives in a suburb of Chicago with his wife, Pam Becker, who is a retired Tribune editor. Welcome, Howard. We thank are you. so excited to have you. Um, thank thank you. you so much for being here with us virtually. It's really a pleasure um, to host you. So we're here to talk about, among things, uh, your book, uh, The Art of Inventing Hope, uh, your conversations with Ellie Wiesel during the last four years of his life. Um, and you two met in 2012 for work, actually. Um, can you describe or share what that felt like? Um, ner nervous, honored, um, surprised? <laughs> it was stunning because I never even thought I would meet Elie Wiesel. In fact, when I was working on a previous book, uh, which was where I, called Prisoner of Her Past, which I tried to piece together my mother's unspoken Holocaust childhood, the publisher tried to get a blurb from Elie Wiesel for the back of the book. And they couldn't, we couldn't get to him. You know, you couldn't get, get to this famous, world famous celebrity. So I never thought I'd meet him. And then one, one uh, afternoon in October of, or maybe even September of 2012, I was out on a story as always, and I get a phone call from my editor. And he reminds me that each year, the Chicago Tribune gives out its a literary prize. And it always goes to some giant of literature, you know, uh, uh, Arthur Miller or people of this global stature. And he said to me, this year, the prize is going to Elie Wiesel. And as soon as he said that, I knew what that meant for me, or at least some of what that meant for me, because I'm the son of two Holocaust survivors. So I understood immediately Wiesel's significance, but what this assignment meant, what this word meant would be that I would be asked to go to New York to interview Professor Wiesel for a big story in the Chicago Tribune. And then beyond that, to interview Professor Wiesel on the stage of Orchestra Hall, where the Chicago Symphony Orchestra performs nightly in front of 2,500 people. And the editor said to me, would you be interested? So I thought, well, I think I could probably fit that into my schedule. <laughs> there was only one problem. At that point, I had not read one word that Elie Wiesel had written. And the reason was, as I mentioned, the son of two Holocaust survivors, I have found Holocaust literature to be very difficult for me. To me, it's personal. This is my family's story. And so I only would read something like this if it's related to an assignment. Well, now the assignment was here. So I spent three weeks reading as much as I could by him, a crash course in Elie Wiesel. And I went to New York to meet him with, with some awe. I mean, it's Elie Wiesel. He's the world's most uh, famous, beloved Holocaust survivor and he's a Nobel Peace Prize laureate. Like, how did I get in the room? <laughs> and then, so I, I meet him in the lobby of, the, of his little suite of offices and he takes me back to his corner office. And the office is from floor to ceiling books. It's all books. The hallway is all books. Every table has books on it. We go to his, his office, we're sitting uh, knee to knee, corner to corner. The coffee table is four, four deep with books. There's certainly not room for any coffee. And so it's somewhat overwhelming. And I begin talking to him and I now realize, I think in retrospect, that we became friends in the first four minutes of our meeting. And I believe that happened because he said to me at that point, at that four minute point or so, I wanna show you something. And he got up from the couch where he was sitting and he walked across the room to his desk, took out a little tablet of paper, came back and he said, I wanna show you this. He said, I've never shown this to anyone on the outside, certainly not to any journalists. I thought, whoa, this is a, is a document that had recently surfaced. Something, a tablet of paper that he had written when he was 13 years old, at the time of his bar mitzvah, his thoughts on mysticism in Hebrew prayers. 
And this document had just surfaced after all that had happened. His, most of his family had not survived and most of mine had not. So I felt at that moment, he kind of took me into his inner circle. And that's when our conversation, which it turned out would last four years, began. Yeah, I feel like it's such a heavy beginning to such a, a deep and meaningful um, connection because you mentioned in the book, and I'm going to speak about the book, yeah. a little bit of spoilers, but for those that um, haven't had a chance to read it, um, he really be kind of became the surrogate father um, or just the survivor figure to a lot of people. You talked about them coming to him with their questions. Yeah. Um, and he really he really did that for a lot of people. And it sounds like he really did that for you as well. Yeah, yeah he did. Um, I didn't realize that it was happening, but we had a, what was supposed to be a half an hour interview became, I don't know, an hour and a half or so. And while we were talking every 15 minutes, the secretary was knocking on the door. You know, some, all these people in the world want to talk to him, presidents, prime ministers, and he's spending all this time with me. So then it came time for the big event in Orchestra Hall. You could not get a ticket to this event. Weeks in, events, weeks in advance, it was sold out. It was like a, a civic event to hear Elie Wiesel. And people would be calling me. How can I get in? How can I get a ticket to this? What can I give you? You know, Chicago style. And I said, uh, I'm sorry, I can't do anything for you. I've got, I've got one seat on stage. And then after the event, my wife and I went to the airport with him to bid him farewell. And I thought, this has been the greatest four weeks of my life because I got to meet him in New York. I got to write the story, was on stage with him, take him to the airport. How lucky can you get? But it wasn't the end of the story, it was the beginning. Because as we were saying farewell to each other at the airport, I hugged him, my, my wife hugged him. And he said to me, you've got my number, right? I said, you mean your phone number in New York? <laughs> he said, yeah, you've got my number, right? And I said, yeah. And then he went off on the airplane. And I thought, what does he mean by that? Am I supposed <laughs> to call him and ask him, you know, how's it going? I would never presume. And so I spent the next week torturing myself over that <laughs> question. Am I supposed to call him or not? And the next week, I'm still torturing myself over the question. And finally, on Friday, almost two weeks later, it dawned on me. This is a book. This is two generations a survivor and a son of survivors talking about this cataclysmic subject. And so that Monday, I finally did decide to call him. Now it's two weeks in one day. And I'm wondering, does he even remember who I am? <laughs> it's been a couple of weeks, you know, and, and will he know? But anyway, I called, I got past the secretary, the assistant, he gets on the phone and he doesn't, e and he doesn't even say hello. He says, the first thing he says to me is, I told many people about you, which means either he remembers me or he thinks I'm someone else, which is fine too. <laughs> and then I suggested this idea about this book and he immediately said yes. And we spent the next four years in conversation with my tape recorder rolling. That's just, I'll probably say this over and over again, but just so power, just so powerful. And uh, you know, no pressure to you, but I, yeah. <laughs> but I think you really did it justice. Um, it's a heavy, heavy topic. Yeah. Um, speaking of heavy things, um, you know, and if, sorry, I want to go back. I forgot to say in the beginning, if anyone has questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. Um, this isn't an exclusive conversation. We want you to be a part of the discussion as well. Yeah. Um, one thing that really struck me uh, was thinking about trauma in terms of how generational that is and how we pass that on unintentionally or how we carry that um, as children. And I just thought that was so powerful how you kind of you came to that realization um, of how you were carrying that. Um, do you still feel like you're on that journey of kind of coming to terms with that and healing, I guess you could say? I think it's something you always struggle with if you're a Holocaust survivor or a survivor of, uh, or the, of any kind of genocide or any kind mm -hmm. of trauma. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go to the Holocaust to find trauma. You can find it on the west side of Chicago, you know? You can find it in New Orleans after Katrina. Um, trauma just means your life is threatened or you're watching someone's life threatened and that never leaves your consciousness. And so the reason, I, this was a subject that I mentioned, I'd, I'd avoided most of my life, even though both my parents are survivors, this was not a subject discussed much, much in our house. In fact, the literature says that most parents, most survivors did not share this with the story of what happened to them to their, with their children because they said, there are no words to describe what happened. 
and they didn't want to relive the worst part of their life and they didn't want to burden us with it, but it was there. It was there in, in all of their angst and anguish. And so I avoided it as much as I could until the night of February 15, 2001. And then that night, my mother, who was then a 69 year old Holocaust survivor living in our little house in Skokie where we grew up, she packed her bags that night and went running out on the streets of Skokie running for her life. And she did it again the next night. And it turns out she was retracing her Holocaust experiences. But I didn't understand that. It took me quite some time to figure that out. And that forced me to finally confront this subject because my mother was reliving it. And my mother is now 90, believes to this day that there's a yellow star of David on her clothes. Those traumas never go away. And so I wrote a, uh, a book and a film about my mother and find out as much of my family's past as I could. And by meeting Elie Wiesel and spending those four years, that enabled me to try to understand what happened. First, I had to learn what happened, and then he would explain to me what happened. And why did he do this? I often, why did he decide to spend all this time with me? I think he was expressing this to the entire second generation and third generation, and anybody who's, who wants to learn about the, uh, the ever echoing effects of genocide. He was speaking to the world. Yeah, I mean, you really, kind of became this vessel <laughs> for this yeah. um this story and you talked about that a lot and i thought it was or it struck me uh was being a witness you know you became you were a witness from your parents but didn't quite know what it meant no one was talking about it and then you know processing it with ellie and you talk can you talk a little bit about the power of being a witness and what that means yes and this is something i learned very much from professor wiesel in fact i never even thought about it in those terms I just thought I'm the son of two, two survivors and I wrote my mother's story. But to Professor Wiesel, being a witness is not only an important thing to be, he, it's, a, it's a biblical requisite. Um, he said, uh, he quoted uh, a biblical chapters, uh, uh, you are my witness for I am the Lord, uh, words to that effect. He says it's a biblical precept. It applies specifically to this experience and others, the Holocaust, because he felt, he made this amazing thought. He said, to hear a witness is to become a witness. And I believe he spent his life, his career, making untold, uncounted millions of witnesses through his writings, through this book, Night, and through his appearances around the world. You know, wherever I go with this book, either uh, via Zoom or before that in person, there's always someone in the audience that, oh, I heard him speak at that town. I heard him speak at this university. It was important to him that this story not be forgotten. And so he felt it is our duty, not just mine, but all of our duty to be witness to all the genocides that happen. He referred to the Holocaust as a uniquely Jewish event with universal applications. We must wow. learn, to learn for it for everybody. It's not for Jews only, it's for everybody. And key to that is being a witness and telling the story because he said there are deniers now and there'll be more deniers in the future. And it's our, our job, he said, is to not let the killer sleep well. Wow. Yeah, I feel like I'm just going to keep saying the word powerful, you know, just really the power and the weight behind that really strikes me. And especially the part about being a witness, I thought that was really interesting because it immediately made me think about oral history and how that used to be how we pass things down from generation to generation. So I, I think that's really interesting the way that, you know, this is how we carry that story and carry that witness um, through this oral history because, you know, the killer can't sleep sleep easy or sleep well at night. <laughs> yes, and he said, he said uh, the most important word he said in Jewish culture is zachor, which means memory, remember, remember. He said, without memory, we have nothing. We have no culture, we have no history, we must remember. Yeah, wow. Um, switching gears just a little bit, there's a question in the chat, which okay. I'm curious about as well. Uh, what qualities of Elie Wiesel do you think made him so unique? Oh, that's a great question. There's so many things. One is, uh, there's so many. One is, let's start with the power of his writing. To me, he's a poet. The way he, he wrote about a subject that is almost impossible to write about, the Holocaust, words don't do justice, with a degree of poetry that brought us all in, that makes it possible for all of us who were not there to get at least a sense of it. So his poetry, his ability to write, 
his modesty, his, uh, he was the most unlikely and unwilling celebrity I've ever known. He never sought this. The world came to him. He was, I think, a writer and a mystical thinker who the world turned to because of his writings. And so that was, that was part of it. Um, his erudition, he spoke five languages fluently and wrote in various languages. All of his books, by the way, except the first one are written in French and were translated, French being his third or fourth language. Uh, only Night was written, written in a different language. Uh, Night was written in Yiddish. That's the book that the world knows most. And that's been translated into many languages. So um, all of that are some of his characteristics, plus the experience, what he saw. He was there and he tells us what it was like. And I said to him once, uh, I, we should consider, people should consider themselves lucky not to have been there. And uh, no one wants this knowledge. And he said, not necessarily. He said, I would have given anything for this not to have happened. But if it were going to happen, I needed to, to be there and to try, to try to write about it. It felt it was his sacred duty to tell the world about what happened. He was, in a way, the ultimate witness. Yeah, and what an incredible life of service, I feel like. Um, I know you spoke about he took 10 years, right, where he right. didn't talk about it. Right. Um, and that's... That seems really hard, <laughs> but I mean, as with your parents, some people choose not to speak about it, but after those 10 years, I mean, it sounds like all he did was give, yeah. um, give to others, yeah. share, the, share the story, make it so you can share, share that story as well. He said that he, he, he was liberated from Buchenwald on April 11, 1945. And he said, he told, although he was, he'd been a writer, he'd been writing since he was a child, he told himself he would not write about this experience for 10 years. And so I said, why not? And he said, well, uh, he said, I was afraid I wouldn't find the words. I was afraid I wouldn't find the right words. I was afraid even worse that I would use the wrong words. And he said, 10 is an important number in Jewish culture and tradition. So I'd wait 10 years. And he waited exactly 10 years. And in 1955, he wrote Night, uh, which had a different title back then. And it was called, And the World Was Silent which indeed it was when this happened. Most people don't realize this. We think of Night as this very slender book that's just about 120 pages. The okay. original uh, version of Night is about 800 pages. Wow. And he edited it down to its essence, to its absolute essence. And so the, the manuscript of that is in an archive somewhere. And I said to him, well, wouldn't you like to, to publish the, the complete 800 pages? He said, no. Well, I said, well, why not? He said, because I know what's in it. Yeah, but I don't know what's in it. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's his, his, uh, his modesty. And he never knew why night became the, globally, the global phenomenon that it is. Because at first it didn't. He couldn't get it published. He couldn't get it published until Francois Mariac, then a Nobel literature laureate, helped him get it published in France. And for a couple of generations, it hardly sold any. And then eventually the world accepted and came to revere this book. So I said, why? Why do you think, because he said, he said, he gave me this direct answer. He said, I don't know. He said, I've written 60 books. All of my bo other books, he said, are jealous of night and they haunt me in my dreams. So, uh, so I don't know. I think part of the reason night uh, has such an impact is because it's clarity, it's poetry and what it leaves out. It leaves out so much that we supply the rest. Yeah, that's amazing that it went from 800 pages to this, I mean, smallish digestible yeah. thing yeah. um i wasn't required to read it in high school but i was going to europe and i remember reading it on a train in europe and feeling yeah. like i have to you know i have to have to experience this is yeah. such an important book that we all need to read um yeah so i think we all remember when we read that one yeah that yeah. one of his um yeah. i got another question in the chat actually okay. how do you think v cell would approach holocaust education now that most survivors have died as a child of survivors i feel that we have to change the way we approach genocide so that it resonates with this generation well, so, um, I would agree with this question or with that second sentence. Um, here in, in, uh, in Chicago area in Skokie, where I grew up, we have the Illinois Holocaust Mu Museum and Education Center. And they are doing exactly what the questioner says. They are, um, though they bring forth the history of the Holocaust, they explore all genocides. They celebrate Nelson Mandela. They do not make 
barriers or distinctions. Their mission is to change the world and that needs to be our mission too. It's like, we've got to do two things at one point. We've got to make sure the world does not forget what happens and remembers the uniqueness of the Holocaust. But as, uh, but as I said before, Professor Wiesel said it's a uniquely Jewish event with universal application. We have to confront every genocide. Uh, we have to confront what happened to kids in Katrina uh, afterwards, black kids in the lower ninth ward who were stranded um, and because they were poor and black. So uh, yeah, I, I, um, I agree with that. I think Professor Wiesel tried to do that. He did that in his uh, public experiences. Wherever there was genocide, Professor Wiesel was there. He was in South Africa during apartheid. He was uh, championing um, Native Americans. He championed all these ca uh, causes. He said he was ashamed of the racism in the United States. He did not make um, distinctions or, or hierarchies. He, was, uh, he fought genocide at every turn. And I think that's what we must do also. Yeah, I think that's a really great message. Uh, you know, uniquely Jewish event. However, the yeah application and implications are for all of us. Right. Um, yeah. So I think that that helps carrying carrying the story, being the witness, um, keeping the message alive, um, and not letting people forget. Yeah. So one thing along these lines that Professor yeah. Liesel said. He said, "What is morality?" He said, "Morality is the ability." and the duty to say no, to say no when something egregious is happening right at the beginning. And if people had said no when this happened in, uh, in, uh, during the Holocaust or during a party, said no at the beginning, it's, it's better to stop it sooner than later. But he said, morality is the ability and duty to say no. And that's how it applies to all these genocides that still go on. Yeah. Uh I have this expression that I use in parenting, but I feel like it fits here as well. I always say it's easier to loosen a screw than it is to tighten it. Hmm. Or, sorry, no, the other way around. Did I say it the wrong way? Loosen a screw. So it's it's better, let's say no up front to these terrible things, then they get out of control right. and somehow we have to take it all back. I mean, yeah. that doesn't always work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I was thinking more, I'm stuck on this witness thing and carrying yeah. the story. So if anybody else has a different question, you can take me off this uh, train of thought. Um, do you think that there was any guilt coming from your parents? Do you feel um, that they may have felt that they burdened you with this, even unintentionally? I'm, I'm curious if they didn't talk about it because they were trying to save you from it and maybe there was some guilt in there or anything like that? Did you ever get a chance to talk to your mom about that? Yeah, so I, I didn't talk to my parents about this, but I can tell you that I individually and second generation in general seem to help carry a lot of guilt. Mm -hmm. uh, the more I learned about what happened to my parents, which came very late in life when I was working on the book about my mother, the worse I felt about it, the more guilty. Why wasn't I a better son? Why didn't I ask more about this? Why didn't I inquire to hear my parents' story? Uh, why didn't I respect it more? Why didn't I tune in? And I broached that to Professor Wiesel. In fact, because I also mentioned the literature about second generation says guilt is a very common uh, characteristic of, of, of children or survivors and probably of other genocides too. And he says, you should not feel guilty. The second generation should not feel guilty. He said, only the guilty should feel guilty. He said, uh, only the perpetrator should feel guilty. He said, guilt was a word that was made up by psychiatrists after the second, second World War and everybody was carrying guilt. He said, no, I don't want you to feel guilty. So uh, I did feel better about that. But you know, when I visit my mother, which I still do now that the pandemic is over, um, if I don't feel guilt, I feel regret. I feel regret for what happened to my mother and my father. Uh, I feel ineffectual at being able to have done so little to help them. And even when I told that to Professor Wiesel, he disagreed with that too. He said all the children of survivors did, did a lot for their parents just by being, just by being, he said. He said, you were our hope, you were our joy, you were our future, just by being. So if that was the case, I'm glad, but it's easy to feel at the very least um, inadequate in the face of this monumental thing that happened. Yeah, I mean, I think you speak about a lot of things that kids or children, you know, feel about their parents, you know, youth is wasted on the young. We don't realize yeah. Yeah. what we should have asked when we had the chance. And yeah. then, yeah. Right. you know, double, triple that weight exponentially yeah. um, right. con considering the subject matter. 
Uh, yeah. We did get a, a comment here. Yeah. Sandra's not sure if she agrees with that. She oh, said, good. if if you transform that guilt into action, it's a good thing. Yeah, I think so. And um, look, we feel the way we feel. I mean, I, we try to fight the way we feel. Um, but uh, it's one way to look at what we children of survivors inherited. And this, this is the chapter title. One of the chapters in the book is, it's a burden and it's a privilege. Mm -hmm. It's a burden to learn this story, to know what it is, to feel all the pain and suffering of your parents, all the losses that they experiences. But it's a privilege too, to be able to tell the story. I mean, Professor Vissel said, you are a unique generation. You have a unique message. Now go do something with it. You know, so that's that's my privilege is to tell this story. And if it didn't happen, I wouldn't have that privilege. But as as the, as the commenter said, uh, if you transform it into action, then that is uh, that that surely that's a worthwhile thing to do. Yeah, tra transforming and growing, and yeah, maybe that's part of your, you know, one's process of yeah. processing that trauma is right. You know, right. taking taking some steps. And I'm lucky. I feel lucky because I'm a writer. So this is what I get to do, you know, that I, I'm positioned to do it. Um, I got to meet Ellie Wiesel because I worked for the Chicago Tribune. So I feel lucky that I have this outlet and everybody I think needs to just find what is the outlet for them. And it doesn't have to be writing. It can be having kids and teaching these lessons to your kids. I, I think that's, that's really important. I think about that because I have small kids and I think about the trauma that we've been through over these last, you know, lots of years, but, you know, especially this last year. Mm -hmm. And it's important to remember that you can have a good effect on the world. You know, you can do your part, even just at home. You don't have to write right. books right. Uh, necessarily to change the world. Um, you know, the change can start in your own home, in your own family. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a nice, hopeful message to not get so overwhelmed. <laughs> right. And that's what matters most, changing one person's life or educating one person. It was all about educating people because Professor Wiesel would say, um, he, why did this happen? He say he would talk about it all uh, as if it happened yesterday. Why did this happen? He said, how it happened, I know. I know how they, they, they came up with their plans, how they executed, but why did this happen? You know? And he said, I, I try to think about what happened to the psyche of the victimizer to allow them to do this. And he said, basically they were miseducated and mm -hmm. he devoted his life to educating, to countering that miseducation. I think that that's right on. And it something that came up when we had the book discussion on this was the education and the experience and knowing people, you know, meeting a Jewish individual or some other person that you think you have uh, hatred towards. But once you know them, I mean, how do you, how can you continue to hate them? You know, it's that cognitive dissonance. Yeah. So I think that the education right. and getting to know people and broadening your horizons a little bit yeah. um, really can go a long way and all part of your education. We never stop learning, right? And this applies to all of us, white and black and, and Asian and non-Asian. I mean, it's yeah. the other and it's not regarding the other as an enemy, but trying to see the other as a human. And in, in the Holocaust, Jews were not considered human. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there's something biological in us or something, you know, to survive it's yeah. me and them or whatever it is, right. but right. you know, we're, we're not hunter gatherers. Um, yeah. We have to think beyond that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and I do, I have another uh, comment. Uh, Diane says, indeed, words need to become action as well. Sometimes saying no is not enough. It is yeah. a necessary and often only first step. What action should we take in the face of hate? I agree with the critical quest for education and love a curriculum based on hope. So what, based on your experience, uh, what are some actions you think we should take in the face of hate? So I asked Professor Wiesel exactly this question. And of course he would not give me an answer. Um, he, said, I'm, he said, I'm not the judge. I'm not gonna tell you what to do. Everyone has <laughs> to find for themselves what to do. Um, regarding words, he said, there's this wonderful statement that I think I quoted three times in the book, three or four times. He said, words can sometimes in moments of grace attain the quality of deeds. So words can sometimes in moments of grace attain the quality of deeds. I think what he means is when you say no at a critical moment, when you stop someone, a word becomes an action. But there are many ways to be activists by writing, by talking by setting an example, by making a painting. He wants us all to find our own way, 
our own personal way. He would not prescribe a way that second generation people or any of us should change the world. That's for us to do. He said, more important is, is the mission. You know, it's, it's not forgetting and not letting the, the killers sleep well. How we do that is something we have to find for ourselves. There's no, there's no menu that, um, or, or agenda for, the, for all of us to follow. We do it ourselves. I mean, that, I think that, that on one hand, that can be super frustrating. You know, tell me what to do. I want to take action. But on the other hand, like that's kind of liberating, saying that there's not a prescript, you know, prescribed way to do this. Um, we can all feel empowered, you know, just to combat hate and keep the, you know, the story alive um, for what works best for you. Yeah. And along these lines, I asked him, for instance, this, the Holocaust survivors that I know, they had children and yearned to have grandchildren. They wanted to have, of course they would. They want to see life continue where once death prevailed. So I said to him, well, what if you don't have children? Which in fact, I do not. Mm -hmm. Have we failed? And he said, we have to be very sensitive to people's feelings. He said, sometimes people can't have children or they don't want to have children. He said, in that case, their children can be their books. He said, obviously referring to someone like me. In other words, there are many ways, there are many ways to change the world, not just one. Yeah. Oh, um, got some more stuff in the chat here. Right. Um, Jill actually was able to attend a lecture that he gave at Beth L Synagogue in Highland Park, Illinois. Well, which is the next suburb over from where I live. Oh, how funny. And she said yeah. she still hears his voice in her head. Yeah. So all these years later. Cool. Um, and she did have a question. She was curious about the title of your book. Why did one need to invent hope versus maintaining hope or remaining hopeful? Uh, curious about the choice of words on that title there. Okay, so first of all, um, she did just prove one of my theories, which is that wherever I go, someone has heard him speak. So thank you, Beth. Um, and that's not a plant. I didn't know she was going to say that. Um, so the, t the title comes from words that Professor Wiesel said himself. He said, my, uh, my job, what he said, what I try to do as a teacher and as a writer, what I try to do for my students and my readers is teach them the art of listening and the art of inventing hope where there is no hope. Mm -hmm. Now, this is exactly what he and the other survivors did because there was no hope in this situation. Uh, you had the, you know, the greatest military complex in Germany deciding to eradicate a people. There was no hope. And yet they found hope because they survived. He sa said to me, and he says in his books too, it'd be very easy to end it all. If you're in a concentration camp, the barbed wire was electrocuted. All you have to do is go over there and it's over. Step out of line, you'd be shot. And yet these people, that very rarely happened. These people tried to, they hoped. Um, and so he believed that sustaining hope was not only the thing to do, but it was kind of also a biblical pre precept. He said, we as Jews are forbidden to despair. You must always, you must always extend hope. And those are words, but as I say, he and the survivors showed that in what they did afterwards, because af those who survived, they could have gone on rampages of vengeance. They could, have, they could have become anarchists. They went to other countries. They learned other languages. They had husbands, wives, children. They rebuilt. They, they answered barbarity with civility. And Professor Riesel said that was the noble thing to do. And in that way, they were, they were inventing hope where there once had been no hope just by living there, sustaining hope. And that's why he's trying to convey to us that we, with our travails, which in general are smaller than what he and the survivors went through, must also believe in hope. And that's why I thought that would be the, the title for the book. That it, in fact, it's a hopeful message. And I, that's what I wanted to convey with the book. Thank you. You used the word noble, which got me thinking about, uh, you talked about a little bit in the book as well, but forgiveness and anger, not being angry. I'm curious if you could expand on that just a little bit. Well, um, so regarding forgiveness, um, I talked to him quite a bit about that and there's a chapter in the book on that. And I had a much more black and white view. I simply said to him blankly, there's no forgiveness for this. And their forgiveness if someone steps on your toe or jaywalks, but this is a, a different caliber. Um, and then we, we talked, he had written about Jews who after the war decided to live in Germany. And he said he would never do this. Anyway, what it came down to it in forgiveness, he said, uh, forgiveness is not relevant 
not forgetting is what is relevant. He, and he says, as to for, forgiving, he said, only the dead can forgive. He mm -hmm. cannot offer forgiveness or, uh, or, or forgiveness for genocide and for what for the for millions that only the dead can do that he refused to dwell on forgiveness he was more interested in not forgetting remembering and not letting it happen again there's no absolution for this as far as he was concerned as far as i was concerned it was just not important it was not what the subject's about it's what's important is not letting it happen again not letting in my opinion others off the hook for unspeakable crimes I think, I think that's really interesting because I feel like there's a message, oh, forgiveness is a part of um, healing and moving on and being okay. But I like that you're saying like, no, I don't have to forgive you. And I can also be okay and move on with my life, you know, and be a happy person. Because I feel like, you know, forgiveness is supposed to be wrapped up in that. Yeah. Um, so I kind of like that, you know. Yeah, I, I personally have never <laughs> understood that, that here's the magic wand, we call it forgiveness and all as well. Because that means forgetting, you know. You just must remember. You, we, mu we must remember. And as you say, the number of survivors is just decreasing uh, exponentially. Uh, my mother was, uh, was one of the youngest survivors. She was nine years old or 10 years old or so when this happened. She's now yeah. 90. You know, we are coming to the end of that. And so it's, it's, our, it's all of our job to just uh, keep, keep telling the this, this story, which is what we're doing right now. Yeah. I just want to say you got, a, you got another person in the, in the room that uh, saw the commencement address at DePaul U for gra their graduation. Wow. Yeah. Great. So I love yeah, Chicago there ever. ever <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little jealous. Yeah. Um, I just, I, I was gonna say about forgiveness and everything. And we talked about yeah. channeling those feelings into action. Yeah. And I like the idea that, you know, stay angry, it's okay. Or what, you know, however you feel and and channel that into how you tell your story, how you process, and how you continue to be a witness. So. Yes, along these lines, it occurs to me that another thing Professor Wiesel said, he said, suffering conf confers no privileges. It's what mm -hmm. you do with the suffering that counts, you know? It's what you do with the, with the anger. It's what you, it's your actions as the previous, as Beth or someone said, it's what your actions that count. It's looking forward and not backward. Yeah, it's all about, Putting it into action, yeah, I feel right. like is is the, right. the key thing here. Yeah. Uh, one thing I am really curious about too is totally not totally changing, mm -hmm. but changing directions just a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, you can You talked a little bit about that pilgrimage, that pull to where your family is from or where these terrible, terrible things happened, um, and you made that journey, right? Yeah. Yeah. Did that. I mean, what did that do? For, I mean, did you feel, I mean, I'm imagining kind of like this wholeness, kind of like a complete relief almost. Like, oh, I made it, I'm here. Yeah, it was, it was I just- I could be way wrong. <laughs> no, it was just uh, the mo one of the most profound things. So as I mentioned, what happened to my mother, she's retracing her steps. Um, I got her into a, a nursing home near my house because she was, I was afraid I was gonna lose her. I was she was gonna keep running away and escaping. And the doctors gave her this diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. She was reliving her past. So when I did everything I could for my mother, put her in a comfortable, safe place where she couldn't run away and escape and get lost, I now needed to find out the story. So I went to this little town where my mother was born, which is on the, on the other end of the earth. It was, at the time was easternmost Poland. Now it's in U Ukraine. It's a little, it's a small little town. And when I stepped on those streets to know this is where my mother was before her world fell apart. Because what I discovered was she was born in 1931. In 1939, the Russians came and invaded the town when she was eight years old. And they took over, the officers took over the family house that they lived in and pushed all the family members into the kitchen. And the officers took over. That's what my mother found can happen to you when you're eight years old. Two years later in 1941, the Nazis arrived and began executions of the Jews of Dubna. And by October of 1942, nearly the less than 100 Jews of a population of 12,000 have been executed. My mother is one of the few to escape that execution. And she spent the next three years running and hiding. So when I'm now finally on the street in the house, in the actual house that I found, and on the fields where these people were killed, I feel I'm stepping into my mother's, into, I'm stepping into the very memories 
that are now haunting my mother. And that is like the ultimate of being a burden and a privilege because I got to see these places for myself and I got to, I got to experience them. And it's not a vague amorphous thing in my mind. Now I see the house, the street. I know what her life was like before all this happened. And it was just truly one of the greatest and one of the most painful privileges I've ever had. But I'm so, I feel so lucky that I was able to do that and, and, and that I will never forget. And that has changed my understanding of who I am and what my parents experienced. Yeah, I was gonna share my little story and then I think this comment all kind of ties in together. Yeah. As a tourist, I visited Dachau twice, yeah. Yeah. Um, no connection. And I mean, I felt, I mean, I felt it as well. Yeah. So I can yeah. only imagine yeah. um, having that direct connection, connection and uh, what that would mean for you. Cause yeah. you know, even as a stranger, yeah, uh, I, I could feel it and feel the impact and, and the history. Yeah. So this, uh, I'm probably going to say your name wrong. Kana. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, she says, in remembering, how do you feel about the landmarks across Europe that show the destruction of the Nazis? Auschwitz itself remaining intact. Uh, we are taking down statues and monuments here, and I wonder how this will affect future generations' awareness. Okay, so regarding uh, Europe, um, I find there are too few monuments, not too many. Uh, in most of the European cities I've been to, and I've been to a lot of them, there are very few mo monuments uh, acknowledging what happened, uh, especially those countries in the former Soviet Republic, the USSR, mm -hmm. there's a sign, here's where the citizens of so-and-so died. It doesn't even acknowledge they were killed for their identity. Uh, so uh, Auschwitz in the museum is the rare exception, actually. So the more, the better. Um, and uh, regarding... Um, Regarding the United States, that's um, something, it's a more complex argument, uh, but the more we know, the better, I would say that. But I just, I, I, I just don't find comparison between the two, or if, we, if it were, it'd be like a five hour discussion. So <laughs> I'll stick to what I know. Is it, is, it, is it strange to you that someone like me or whomever uh, tourists go to these camps and locations? Is it you know, part of their vacation? I'm grateful. I am so grateful because sometimes I, I feel that I spend much of my time, as I say, preaching to the choir, talking to the already converted. You know, it, that's why the of all the invitations I get, the ones to libraries and the ones to universities are, are the ones I really treasure so much because that takes me out of the, the circle, out of the circle of, of Jewish people, to people who don't know or want to know or, or really care so that you go all the way over there, I'm, I'm internally grateful for that. And when you and other people do that. Oh, that's good. That's good to know. Cause sometimes it, you don't know, you know, you want to show respect. Um, yeah, no, it's and, much appreciated. And, and, and learn as well at this, at the same time. Um, this reminded me of something when I was studying German, I had a, a tutor from Germany, a young woman. And she says, Oh, when do we have to stop apologizing? Or like, when can we stop? Like, yeah. Oh, all the time, you know, we're always saying, sorry, but I, I don't think, I mean, ha, I, we shouldn't stop educating. Right. We shouldn't stop putting up monuments or memorials. Yeah. But do you have thoughts and feelings about it? Yeah. yeah. I'd I love to hear. For the younger people, um, you know, my age or your age, who is much younger than me, they don't have to apologize. They shouldn't apologize. Uh, they're not, they're, they have nothing to apologize for. It's a Professor Wiesel would say, there's no such thing as collective guilt or collective innocence, you know? Let the guilty apologize. Uh, they are not responsible. Uh, that doesn't mean that they don't have to acknowledge what happened. And as you say, educate themselves and us about it. We have to acknowledge the history of uh, the history, that history as much as we have to acknowledge the United States history and all the horrible things that happened. So I don't think, they had they should not be apologizing but they should be educating us so this book that we're talking about it came out in 2019 right yeah. mm -hmm. so this is after per professor Vissel has already passed yeah um were you were you disappointed that you didn't get to put this out or was that did you feel that was part of the process um to be able to finish it so here's what happened so uh -oh. <laughs> I spent almost four years working on this. I was visiting him in winter. He, winters he'd spend in Florida. I would go there and spend weeks with him, come back to Chicago. And, and the other rest of the year, I'd go to New York. We talk on the phone a lot. So it constant. So it's, first of all, I spent 
a lot of time transcribing. I had like two Manhattan telephone directories of transcription, if there even is a telephone directory for Manhattan <laughs> anymore. So, um, and then I got, it came time to write it. So I wrote it. And at the beginning of this process, I said this to Professor Wiesel, you will be the first one to see this manuscript. No one will see it before you, not my wife, not my literary agent, and certainly no publisher. He said, fine, he didn't ask me for that, but that's what I said. So finally, I finished the damn thing. So um, I sent it to him in Florida, it happened to be winter. And he said, he said, send it to me and then come to Florida, we'll, we'll go over it. So I sent it to him and then I flew to Florida with some trepidation because now it's the culmination. I mean, have I blown it these four years? Am I talking to myself? Uh, what? So, um, he, so that I sent it to him the next day after I arrived, we met in his hotel in the lobby as always, hugged hello. But I noticed he was not holding the manuscript, which I thought was not necessarily a good sign. So um, we sat down at the usual two chairs where we sat. We made some pleasantries, talk, blah, blah, blah. So, and he's not even bringing it up. So I thought, so I said, um, well, would you, want, would you want to go over the manuscript? And he said, no. I said, well, wouldn't you want to go over the manuscript? I mean, that's why I came here. He said, no, it's very good, nothing to change. And that was the entire editing process between him and me on that book. And I booked a whole week in Florida to do nothing but go over this book with him. So we just sat around talking for the whole week as we always had done. Um, so that, but I always presumed wrongly that he would be around when the book came out. It never mm -hmm. dawned on me that he wouldn't be here. I thought he'd be around forever, I guess, unconsciously, because he always had been around forever before in, in my life. Uh, and so when he would die, he died, I was shocked. Excuse me, let me take a sip. And although I regret, or I'm sorry that he didn't see the finished book, I am tremendously relieved that he saw the manuscript. Because if he didn't, I would always be left wondering, did I do yeah. it or did I? Does, did I capture it or didn't I, you know? And now I know he did not want to change one word of that, of that book. And I'm also so grateful I got the chance to write that book because if, because if I didn't, what happened between us would be gone. It would be gone in the ether. It would be a, a, a distant memory. And now it's something that I can share with people. I'm so grateful to have this book and that he read it. it sounds like he knew that all along. You know, he knew it was your, your story, your witness to tell. Um, yeah. You know, and, and what could, he can't tell you how to, or he couldn't tell you how to feel or what to do with that. So. You're right. You're right. He would not have. He would not have. <laughs> I think that was another sign of it. This is your book. Uh, because sometimes he would tell me a story when we were, I was interviewing him and I'd say, are you sure you want to put this in? And he'd say, put it in, put it in. <laughs> so I put it in. What a, what a character. <laughs> yeah, amazing person. Sounds like a very good person. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Diane commented that she's really glad that you, or we're all glad that you wrote this book too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I am curious, since we're coming to the end, you've retired. Are you on a mission doing new things or is this book, you're carrying this book out to the world, sharing it? Um, so I retired from the Chicago, I retired yeah. from the Chicago Tribune in January of this year. Um, I've been writing about music and the arts for the newspaper, for this newspaper for 43 years. Wow. Uh, but for the past year, there had been no concerts, of course, because of the pandemic. I mean, I'm an arts critic. There have been no concerts. There were none in the foreseeable future. I thought this is a good time I mean, this, you've got to leave at some point. I don't want them to like throw me off the tower or something. So <laughs> you've got to leave at some point. And I thought, this is a good point. I, I'd rather spend now all my energy on my books, films, and speaking engagements. So mm -hmm. yes, I can, I'm continually speaking about this book wherever anyone invites me. And my next documentary film is coming out in the fall. And oh, great, that, great. that film is called For the Left Hand. And I'll just say in a sentence or two what it's about. It's about um, a, a man who's in his 80s now, but when he was five years old, he discovered his love of the piano. He grew up in the housing projects on the south side of Chicago. He's African-American. And, and when he was 10, a terrible thing happened to him. His father attacked him and his brothers. And then while they were sleeping, his father killed himself. He was, it, was try it was an attempt at murder-suicide. The boys survived. But this young man, who by then was already an accomplished pianist, now could only play the piano with his left hand. And wow. so he became a, a very accomplished music, high school music teacher. And when I wrote about him in 2015, a series of a stories in the Tribune, suddenly he got invitations to give concerts for the first time in his life at age 78. 
Wow. And I thought, now this is a documentary film. So we've been filming it for the past few years. It's called For the Left Hand, and it will be released into the world in the fall. So between this book and that film and some other project I can't even announce yet, I am very busy. <laughs> I just don't have to also write four to five pieces a week for the Tribune. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you want to keep up with Howard, he has his website, howardreich.com, right? Right, exactly. Um, do you have uh, social media as well? Yes, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter. And if anybody wants to email me after this, a question, comment, criticism, uh, <laughs> my, my email address is howard at howardreich.com. Or if you can't remember, just, just go to howardreich.com. You can email me from there. I, I'm eager to talk to people who read this book or want to talk about it. Yeah, thank you so much um, for being here with us, for you know hearing these stories, writing your story, continuing to share. Um, Again, powerful stuff. I mean, really, really impactful. I think this is something that we'll all carry with us. And if you haven't read the book yet, you can check it out from the library, ccpl.org. Uh, and we're getting lots of thanks in, oh, in the chat you. for you. Um, thank you. Thanking you for speaking. I'm gonna stop our live stream. So thank you all for joining us so much.